chapter what? 25, 26, 27. <laughs> part of 25, the last part of Acts 25. We'll pick up in verse 23 in a minute. Let's see, I'll go to this side, I guess, today. Get out of the way. <clears throat> I know y'all are thinking we'll never get done with these guys. We'll never get done with Paul. But we will someday. I don't know what day that'll be, what year that might be, but we'll get done. Uh, but I enjoy reading it. I enjoy studying about him uh, myself. And hopefully you have learned something as we've gone through this about his journey and about Paul, how he's dealt with things. Um, of course, we're in part six of this imprisonment because he's still in Caesarea. We're dealing with that. He's still being Caesarea at this point. Um, almost persuaded. How is your response to the gospel? Because in this lesson here, you're going to hear uh, where King Agrippa says he's almost persuaded to be a Christian. And I think it's kind of uh, interesting to, the focus on that point about being persuaded, almost persuaded at that. And that's what we're going to talk about persuasion and with the gospel and, um, and persuasion and response, of course, because that's what's involved here. Hearing the gospel and what is your response? And we'll deal with that here as we go through this. Then, King Agri then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And that'll be, you know, that's a theme here. But we'll talk about that get to later in this passage in the study we'll go through. The potato. He said, what has this got to do with the lesson? <clears throat> it was hard to believe that the potato was not accepted. People didn't want it. Thought it was for hogs only. It wasn't for human consumption. Sir Walter Raleigh tried to introduce it to England and the people did not like it. They thought it, this was ridiculous. It was first introduced in England by Sir Walter Raleigh, which he lived between the 1552 and 1618. So that kind of gives you the time frame when it was introduced to England. Newspapers printed editorials against it. Ministers preached against it. The general public would not touch it. It was considered supposed to be sterile. It would sterilize the soil in which it had been planted. It would cause all manners of disease, is how they thought of it. It was not to be consumed by humans. There was, however, a few brave men who did not believe all the propaganda being shouted against it. It was seen as an answer to famine among the people, the poor classes, of course. And as a healthful and beneficial food, still, there were few noblemen in England could not persuade their tenants. You know, of course, you know, you got the noblemen, you got the tenants, could not persuade them. Go ahead and try this. Go ahead and do it. Could not persuade them at all to cultivate the potato. It was years. It was years before all the adverse publicity was overcome and the potato became popular. Trying to persuade people, this is good for you. A Frenchman named Paramentier, he lived in 1737 1813. So quite a few years after Sir Walter Raleigh, he had took a different tactic. He had been a prisoner of war in England when he first heard of the new plant. His fellow prisoners protested the outrage of having to eat potatoes. The fellow prisoners did not want to eat it. They didn't like it. They complained about it. Perimeter instead thoughtfully inquired about the methods of cultivating and cooking this new food. Upon his return to France, he procured an experimental farm from the emperor in which he planted potatoes. When it was time to dig them at his own expense, he hired a few soldiers to patrol all sides of his potato patch during the daytime. Meanwhile, he conducted days distinguished guests through the fields, digging up a few tubers here and there. And, and when they devoured with evident relish, at night he began to withdraw his guards. A few days later, one of the guards hastened to perimeter with the sad news that the peasants had broken into the potato fields patch and dug up most of the crop. Perimeter was overjoyed. Not much to the surprise of the informant and exclaimed, when the people will steal in order to procure potatoes, their popularity is assured. 
Could not persuade people in certain ways, but he persuaded them a different way. He put guards around to make it like it's valuable and took the guards away. He persuaded the people a different way. But not with the gospel here. Paul does what? We'll talk about this. Paul preaches the gospel to many people. And some people are not persuaded no matter what. Kind of broke this down. It was kind of hard to break it down, but this is how I broke it down for us. The introduction by Festus, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then Paul's response, the Apostle Paul's response, the governor's response, and of course King Agrippa's response and Paul's responses back and forth throughout this. That's how I plan to look at this this morning with us. So look at governor, let's look here at passage in chapter 25 and verse 23. Remember in verse 22, when Agrippa, Agrippa, we talked about that last week, then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself tomorrow, said he, thou shalt, tomorrow, said he, that's Festus, he, thou shalt hear him. So now it's tomorrow in a sense, and it says, on the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered, entered into the palace of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both in Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto to my Lord. Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal, to signify the crimes laid against him. Now picture that, that he is brought before, you know, Paul's brought in, and who you have here? You have King Agrippa and Bernice there, and some other dignitaries are all there, and, 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 and Felix, not Felix, Festus, it makes it hard sometimes to keep Felix and Festus straight here. We just dealt with Fest Felix last week. But Festus, the governor now, is, you know, you see him putting this big show on. You know, it's come to my attention and the Jews are, and what did the Jews? Let's see. He testifies the Jews crying against Paul, that Paul should no longer be living. I mean, that was the Paul's, remember after two years being in prison, the Jews are still adamant, Paul should not be living. Man, we dealt with that last week in the lesson there. And so Fest Festus, is proclaiming to King Agrippa, but I'm a good Roman. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the Roman things to help others. You know, do it the right way by the rules and regulation as a Roman is what I'm doing here. Because I think he's promoting himself as a good Roman. Because when he says, I have determined where he says here, uh, and, but when I found that he had no, not committed nothing worthy of death, and, and that he himself has appealed to, I guess I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write about. You know, but I'm a good Roman. I'm really good at this. You know? I think Festus is kind of promoting himself. You know, I've got this problem here, and I don't know what to do with it. So I bring him before you, King Agrippa, and, and, and gets your, because you're the, you're the king. You're the local king here. You're our majesty in this area. Maybe you can help decide what to do with this problem we've got here. Okay? So, before we get into this, think about the two people that are here, the two people. I'm going to show, I'm going to show you two things, King Agrippa and Bernice, a few about the character background of these people here, if you don't know about them. He's great, his great-grandfather was King Herod the Great and had the babies killed in Bethlehem. Remember that in Matthew there, when King Herod the Great had all the babies killed? That was his great-grandfather. So this has got some, so he's got a little bit of background here. Not pleasant background, but there's, you'll see the background's not any pleasant here either. His uncle, Herod Antipas, killed John the Baptist. This kind of runs in the family, doesn't it? His father, Herod Agrippa, killed James and tried to kill Peter in Acts chapter 12. Now, can you see this situation here? you got King Agrippa II, whose family history is what? Nice, compassionate people and understanding? No. They kill just because for the sake of killing sometimes for their own purposes, what they were for, to do for, to protect themselves and all that. 
So think of this guy that he's standing before. Paul's having to stand before this king who could at the whim, if he wanted to, tell the soldiers, get rid of Paul. But you know what about Paul standing here? Didn't Paul have a promise? And what was that promise he had? He was going to go to Rome. He knew that because the Lord Jesus Christ told Paul that he was going to go to Rome someday. Okay? So Bernice, Queen Bernice, however you want to call her, She's the young, his younger sister. They weren't married because they didn't want to violate, you know, marriage rules and all that. So they weren't married, but they lived together in a bad relationship, of course. But that was his younger sister. But it's not like the first time she's been around either. Her sister, Drusilla, was married to Governor Felix. We dealt with Governor Felix last week, of course. She had previously been married to her uncle, to her uncle until his death. And she became the mistress of Titus, the Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. She became his mistress for a while, and then she went back to King Agrippa later on. Find outstanding characters, are we not here? That Paul has having to stand before at this meeting here with them, plus all the others that were there with him. And this is what he's having to, Paul's having to stand up and pro proclaim the gospel here against these people. People who are a leadership have some fine, outstanding character, don't they? You would vote for them, wouldn't you? Mm, no, we wouldn't. Definitely not if we had the chance. But I just want to give you a couple of background on these two people, two main characters. So here in Acts chapter 6, verse 20, 26 and verse 1, we're going to talk about this. And I am going to read through this. And we're going to go through it as we go through this whole passage. And um, bear with me. I think you need to hear the whole thing that Paul says as we go through this. I'll put these up there for you. He deals with his previous life, his manner of his previous life. And he stands up there and tells, what did he say here? Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be ex expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now think about that. He's asked this king who has what? A very nice history, background history, you know what I mean? The family history. He's asking, I'm asking you to patiently listen to what I have to say here. But you are familiar as king, that you are familiar with us as Jews, and you're familiar with our customs and our beliefs, but you are very familiar with that. <clears throat> my manner of life, verse 4, from my youth, which was at this first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest straightest sect of our religion, I live the Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And what was that hope that he's accused of them? He's telling King Agrippa, I'm standing here because of that hope. What is that hope that was told to our fathers and our 12 tribes that we're looking for. Okay, I hear two, two things at one time. Okay, the Messiah. Resurrection. That's what you were saying? Same thing you were trying to say, okay. That's what they had. Because they had the scriptures looking for the Messiah. And Paul's saying, I believe in the Messiah. The Messiah has come. And that's the hope. And he says here, verse... Uh, where I'm at, verse 8, verse 8, thank you. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Do you see how Paul is laying out even those who's else in that audience with him? You got King Agrippa, you got Bernice, you got 
Festus, but who else? You've got other Jews that are there. Jews who are leaders who have come or are standing there. They know about Paul's history. Some of those people probably knew him when he was a young guy as a Pharisee back then. You know, it's been quite a few years, what, about 15 years he's been, he's been saved and been traveling and all that. But he's saying, these Jews know about me. And they know what I did. I persecuted in the, against this Jesus of Nazareth. That's what I did. He's trying to lay out here before them, this is what I was like. But now he's going to talk about what happened. And he gets here, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Chief priests that are standing right here probably might have been some of the same ones here involved. But I had authority from them to go through this. And he says here, um, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of his sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but shewed first unto all them of Damascus and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and them to the Gentiles, and, and that they should repent and turn to God and do works met for repentance. For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Stop right there. So what did he, can you, I'm just, I know it's a lot. You probably said, I know about this about Paul. I know about the Damascus trip. And I, well, I know about his conversion and all that. But can you picture that with Paul standing in that audience there, explaining to them that had never heard his testimony. He's giving his testimony how he accepted Christ as his Savior, how the Lord appeared to him and how he saw the risen Savior. And he's giving that testimony to them and telling them what? What the Lord Jesus Christ told him that he was going to do, and as what? Has been taking place. He has gone to the Gentiles. He has gone out there and preached repentance to them. And that's what he's been doing on his missionary trips. So now he's telling Agrippa, oh, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to this heavenly vision, but shoot myself first into Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, and they, that they should repent and turn to God and do works met for repentance. He talks about how he went around preaching and telling about people they need to trust Christ as their Savior. For this cause is the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Not that I did anything wrong, Paul says. It's because of this, because of my belief in the hope that was told to us and our fathers. I accepted the hope about the Messiah come and the Messiah has come. That's why I'm being persecuted. That's why I'm having to stand here before you, because those who reject that. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those things than those which the prophets and Moses did say unto should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Can you see that picture there? Paul has come to this point, and who, what does Festus say? Festus, you're mad. You've learned too much. You're, you're, the learning has made you mad. I think some of us think that of, of ourselves. We learn too much and we become mad. But they think, you know, Festus is what? How does Festus responding to the gospel? He just heard the gospel, did he not? They've all heard the gospel at this point that stood in that room. How did he respond to it? He's rejecting it, is he not? He says, this is a madman. This is foolishness. You're, you're crazy, Paul. Are there not people like that? You tell them the gospel? You're a crazy man. You, you believe that junk? 
Have you ever been, you know, you probably have, if you, if you witness and testimony, you share the gospel with people, they're going to look at you, man, he's off his rocker somewhere. You know, the lights are on, but nobody's home. You know, all those kind of phrases, you know, you think about. But that's how the world sees that. And that's how Festus saw this gospel. That there's something wrong with this guy. He's mad. And what did Paul, how did Paul respond to this? But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. Isn't it interesting how he addresses Festus, noble Festus? And we know Festus is not a present guy either. But he still shows respect, still showing respect to somebody in authority as well. May not agree with me, but I still show him respect. It doesn't do any good to, to land blast them and be, berate them, does it? No, it doesn't. But he says, oh, noble Festus, but speak forth, I, you know, he's saying, I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. He's still what? He's still addressing the king Agrippa. King Agrippa knows these things. He says, I haven't hid anything from him. For this, the, the, for this thing was not, no, what, was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear, my, hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. King Agrippa, how did he respond to the gospel? He was listening. He was thinking about it. You know? He was almost persuaded because he's thinking. He wasn't like Festus, you know, you're a crazy madman, but he was thinking about it. But he was not persuaded in his heart to accept Christ for whatever reason. Be it because I'm a king, the dignity of the king, and I could not do that or whatever it might be. You let those other things get in the way. Do not other people do the same thing. They let a lot of things hold them back. They may be almost persuaded. They're close, but they just will not step out and accept Christ by, say, by faith. Almost persuaded. What did Paul, how did he respond back to him? I know I'm going pretty fast on this. I'm very going through the other parts of this. Let me stop right there. Paul testified to everyone, regardless. Did he not say he, he spoke to the small and to the great? It didn't make any difference to Paul, who he talked to. Nobody. But what did he tell them? When he testified, what did he tell them? He tell, told them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he told them what? How he got saved. Should not we do the same thing? We may not know a whole lot of things. And everybody said, well, I know how to be a witness. I know how to test, tell, talk about the Lord. Just tell what the Lord has done in your life. How the Lord has changed you. You know? You may, not, you may only know a few passages of Scripture. You may only know John 3, 16. You may only know a few things. But share the few things that you do know, because you never know how much little that you know could be of help to somebody else. But Paul, of course, very well eloquent in the scriptures, he was able to share a lot. But he did what? He talked about the change that Christ did in his life, just like he did here in this meeting with those people. This is what I did. I persecuted these Christians. I hated them. But when I met the Savior, he changed my life. What about us? Are we witnessing to others when, when the opportunity arises? Or do we just, mm, I, I don't know how to be a witness. We, we do prayer requests, don't we? Don't? Pray for my loved ones. But are we witnessing? Are we doing that part in our lives to be a witness? to? You never know. You're praying, you say, pray for my loved ones. And there's somebody else probably praying for this loved one that you met at the store or the, the gas station. And you share the gospel with them. Maybe somebody's been praying for them. You know, first time you met these people, you don't know these people. But somebody may be praying for them to get saved. We need to be a witness, a testimony to people we deal with. Amen. Paul emphasized the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In three places here, I point out, in verse 20, chapter 26 and verse 8, he says, when he says to King Agrippa, uh, what he says, unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Next passage. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? He's talking about the resurrection. 
before him. He also talks about his whole, remember, we read that long passage here about the Damascus Road. He talks about seeing a risen Christ, about that. And then he says here in verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 23, he says, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. He talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I already touched on it. Festus' rejection of the gospel, and we already touched on that. Now, King Agrippa's response, almost thou persuadest me. Paul's desire to hear, hear, to hear the, for all who hear the gospel to be saved. I guess I didn't put the wording the way I wanted to. But his desire is what? For others to be saved. Those who, who were in that room, you know, there's, there wasn't... <clears throat> There was guards there. There was Jews. There's people from different, probably different walks of life in that same room, servants in that room. He's praying that all of y'all would what? That y'all would be like him, except for the bonds. He knew he was in bonds and chains. Except for that, he would love for them to be saved. You know, maybe somebody got saved in that room. We don't know. We won't know until we get to heaven, of course, who all got saved. But maybe some of them did. Except for we know, apparently it wasn't King Agrippa and it wasn't Festus here, got saved. He aggressive his acknowledgement of Paul's innocence. As we go on, it says here, and when he had thus, verse 30, and when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and, Ber and Bernice, and they, they that sat with them, and when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Can you see that? They got up, they went to a side place here, and they discussed it among their cells. Not in front of the audience, but among their cells. So they could be private in a way about this. But they did what? Their consensus was, Paul hadn't done anything worthy of death. But he's appealed to Caesar, so we got to send him on. Because that's what is, you know, course to our Roman law, that's what has to be done. The thing is that Paul, the King Agrippa was very knowledgeable about the scriptures. He was very knowledgeable about the scriptures, about the Jews, their ways. But he did what? He still rejected the gospel. How many people are very knowledgeable about the scriptures? Probably could raise their hand. I've read through the Bible a hundred times and whatever. I read it through every year and I know all this about the Bible. But have no, never accepted Christ as their Savior. May be very knowledgeable and very, you know, very religious being here, whatever, but never accepting the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. The response of these leaders, I, I thought about this. The governor, Felix, when I have a convenient season, that was his response. Remember when Paul presented the gospel? He says, when I have a convenient season. And remember when he dealt with Felix? How long did he deal with Felix? He's in prison for two years. And it says, it seems like from what, we under, what I can understand from the scriptures, like Felix probably called him in every once in a while just to hear more. You know? In those two years. We don't know how often. But I would think pretty regular on the sense of so often. Maybe he wanted entertainment. I don't know. That's a sense of entertainment hearing this guy talk back then, you know? But he had heard the gospel too. He said, but I want a more convenient season. What's a convenient season? What is a convenient season? You think it's going to ruin your life that you accept the gospel? Festus, he's like, you're crazy. You're totally wacko. You're a madman, Paul. I mean, it's like, I don't even want to hear about this. I mean, I heard it already. I don't want to hear it again. You know, but Agrippa says I was almost persuaded. Close, close doesn't count. We always say close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, you know. It doesn't count in salvation. It doesn't work. No matter how close he is to the gate, if he doesn't accept Christ, he doesn't go to heaven. Yes, Terry. Do you think that King Agrippa was actually being serious when he said that? Or I kind of get this visual of him sitting in there with his you know, hands behind his back, and he's kind of being like, oh, Paul, you know, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian, kind of laughing. Do you think he was sarcastic, or do you think he was... Oh, kind of sarcastical about saying that? Uh, my, my impression is, no, I don't think he was sarcastic about it. But that's to the point. Yes? We have to remember that Felix was holding and hoping to get arrested. 
Oh, yeah, for the two years he held him. He didn't hold him for any crime. He was hoping somebody would pay his way out. Yeah, get some kind of gain, financial gain from that. Yes. I mean, that could be, could be what it was, but I, I don't personally see it that way, but it could have been. So, kind of a sarcastic way. You, know, uh, you almost maybe would be a Christian, yeah. It didn't work, Paul. It just didn't work. The sad part is those guys are where? They're in hell because they rejected the gospel. Even though we got their words right here in the scripture and it's part of scripture, those guys are not in heaven. You know, if they did not accept Jesus Christ, their savior, they're not in heaven. How about you? Have you correctly responded to the gospel? And that's where it gets down to. Have you responded to the gospel correctly and not just be almost persuaded? Most of us will give testimony that we've accepted Christ our Lord and Savior. And I hopefully we all have done so, but I just want to share that. I got saved when I was 18. When, Pastor, when they were doing that little testimony thing, I was, you're kind of watching everybody, seeing what they're doing all that. I got saved when I was 18. I made professions at different times before that kind of forced in a profession. You know, it's like, I don't know about this. Not until I was 18 did I realize I was lost. And then I went to the front, and then I got saved. It wasn't easy, because I... Kept, you know, flashbacks of, well, I thought I was saved and I thought I did that then. You know, it's like, I just had to say, I trust Christ as my Savior. You know, you have to get to that point. That's what you did. You trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not being forced into salvation somehow. I felt like that's what I was at, you know, 14 years old. I was forced into it in a way. But we all have to trust Christ as our Lord and Savior. And these guys didn't do it. I don't think they did, as far as we know. There's no indication they ever did. So what else? <clears throat> Paul's burden for others to be saved. I wanted to point that out. Paul's burden for others to be saved. Should that not be our burden for others? Amen. I mean, it's all good and great that we, and like I said, there's nothing wrong. Pray for my loved ones. Pray for so-and-so. But we need to be actively having a burden for souls and, and actively involved in witnessing to others. You know? It's not somebody else's responsibility to be a witness to them. It's not Pastor Coffee or Pastor Monte's responsibility or the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It's each one of us. Who was the commission given to? It's given to the church, and we make up the church, do we not? So each one of us should what have a burden for souls. Some passages here I want to share with you. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. I think that's interesting about Paul's life. Everything he had gone through and had been going through at this time, no matter what I've gone through is for what? It's not for me to say, hey, I'm the great apostle Paul. No, that wasn't for that. His burden was that I can win somebody to the Lord. No matter who it is, they all need to be saved and I need to witness to them. But the prophet of many that they may be saved. That was his emphasis, his burden for souls all the time. I wrote these other two passages down. I don't have, I'll show them up here to you. Yeah, I got those right here. <clears throat> First Corinthians 9, 19 through 20. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. How is that about us, about being a servant to be a witness to other people? Instead of, I got to have it my way, it should be my way. No, my way is not the right way. My way is to be a servant to who? To the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, unto the Jews, I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law is without, as without law. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might be all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. He said, I did this for what? To make me look good? So I can have the great apostle Paul's in town? No. Paul went through a lot of things. And we talked about that before. Remember what happened to him? What are some of the things that happened to him? For those journeys that he's been on, he's been on three missionary journeys. What were some of the things that happened to him? Stone. He was stoned. Prisoned. Imprisoned. Beaten, left for dead. Beaten, left for dead. Finally, he was crucified upside down. Well, eventually he 
is executed, yes. I don't know how he was executed, but he was executed. Might have been that way. But right now, at this point in his life, that we're at this point, he's been through a lot. It's not like, I guess what I'm trying to picture, it's not like, I'm the great apostle Paul, and y'all just, you know, y'all just, you know, bow down. Hey, I'm doing a great job. Every city he went to, it wasn't like that, was it? He was run out of towns. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked, eventually shipwrecked as well. He talks about that. But he said, all those things happened to me for what purpose? Not to say, there is the great apostle Paul. Nothing ever happens to him. No. Nope. Paul says, look at me. All these things have happened to me. Things that some of y'all would not want to happen to you have happened to him. In weakness and in strength, no matter what. He's had to deal with these things. For what purpose did he say? To win others to Christ. That's his emphasis, to win others to Christ. Everything that happened in his life, how can the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified to win others? 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Do we not have a sense of, well, maybe not all people will get saved. I, I really don't care if all people get saved. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. So what? I'm okay. That should not be the attitude of any of us in this room. Our attitude should be, what, just like Paul said, that all men could get saved. All men and women could get saved. That desire there. Will they all get saved? We know honestly they won't all get saved. But don't let it be on the part of me or you hindering them from being saved. From that part. Almost persuaded. <clears throat> remember this song? We got our songbook, Almost Persuaded. I can't remember the tune. I was trying to think of the tune. I could not think of the tune. Kept working on that. Could not think of it this morning. But how many people, and we use a song sometimes and during invitation, of people that are almost persuaded. But you know, I, I thought about this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And this is my last passage. I don't have it up here. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. You could probably quote this passage. 1 Timothy, you get there. I did not mark it. Chapter 1 and verse 12, it says what? Is it one? Second Tim, I'm sorry, second Timothy. I got second Timothy. I know I wrote second right here. Second Timothy 1 verse 12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. I thought about this, about being, you know, here you got King Agrippa almost persuaded. And here you got Paul saying, I'm persuaded. I know whom I have believed and I know where I'm going. You know, <clears throat> say that again. For this cause... For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's how we should be. We should be able to have that confidence that I am persuaded. I'm out of breath. Uh, Y'all have any comments, any questions? That's the last of That's what I got here for you. Any comments, any questions? throwing rotten potatoes at me. <laughs> yes? What was, what was your question? How come they didn't have more about Bernice and what was so important about her part? Her part in being there? Yeah. Well, she's just part of the King Agrippa's Entourage, not really his wife, but she's there present. I mean, I just gave you a little background of her history, of course, but but she didn't have a whole lot to say either. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It was there. It was available for everybody. Right. Yeah, true. The gospel's for everybody. It doesn't matter what walk of life or career or whatever you've done in your life. It doesn't make any difference. I also think that Billy Cundy was almost persuaded. You know, most people don't accept the gospel the first time together. Mm-hmm. Because it's just not going to work. Yep. But the idea was that you handed them that track. Yep. To get them thinking, at least get them thinking. That's why I was asking, do you think he was being serious with the sinner? Because if he was being serious, then perhaps later on, you know, maybe he did think about it. And, you know, I mean, we don't know. We, we honestly don't know the answer right now. Till now, until we get to the heaven, we'll know if he's there or not. That's yeah, true. With that in mind, I think none of us are uh, great, I guess you want to say. None of us are immune to things. And we all have sin. As we all come from different walks of life. You know, if we go around this room and say, well, how were you before you got saved? Some of us don't want anyone to talk about what we did before we got saved, of course. We don't want to mention those things. And here you got people that, like you said, the whole gamut's right here. These people being present their lifestyles and all of that, they got saved. You know, if they got, if they got saved, you know. But us, those of us, you know, Paul talked about that in, is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? About the Corinthians there. About all these things they did. Such were some of you, you know. But they got saved. Now, like I said, we don't know if King Agrippa or Bernice or any of those ever got saved. There's no indication here in the scriptures we know of. And we don't know if later on they even thought about it. We don't know that. There's numbers doesn't seem to indicate anything, but we don't know. But true. Anybody else? Anything else? Yes, Tony. When Festus said, said you're mad, you know, she was calling him mad. And then you have a higher authority, Griffith, saying he wants to persuade it. Which kind of kind of walked down. I mean they're all in the same room there. I don't know if Festus spread the face about that or you know. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Anybody else? Anything else? Well, that was the first bell, and you go get out just a tad early here. And uh, so we'll get out early. Anybody else? Nothing. All right, let's go, Lord, and pray.